Hershey in Canada, uh, the chocolate maker, had a factory in Smith Falls where I was born, actually. Not in the factory, but... <laughs> you were born in a chocolate factory? <laughs> Did you come out of a Kinder Egg or I was something? born in a chocolate factory. <laughs> um, Hey, Maniacs. It's Midsummer Maniacs. How you doing, Maniacs? I hope you're doing all well. I hope you're all doing well. It's been a crazy week everywhere this week, so. <laughs> the crazy just keeps piling on. Yeah. Just when you think it, it definitely. can't get any crazier, it gets a little bit crazier. Maybe we can be sort of an hour or so of kind of sanity, just talking about <laughs> fake murder. Yes. You know? That's fake a little murder. island of, of comfy. Yes. That's that's and relish. Yes. And naked dudes in the sterilizer. Oh, well, we're going to talk about that naked dude in the sterilizer. <laughs> Episode 42 of Midsummer Maniacs, which is a recap podcast dedicated to the ITV series Midsummer Maniacs. Each week we dig into an episode of the show, including the murders, the mayhem, the loonies and everything else that we love. Just a warning, if your kids can't see a guy naked in a sterilizer, the podcast is probably too much for them, too. We're not going to show any nakedness, are we? No, we never do. It's kind of hard to do in audio. Oh, actually, all we do is show lovey dove. Oh, uh, according, notice. According to the Reddit, we're just the, the nicest couple. That's very nice. Yes, thank you, Reddit, for recognizing that we're, in fact... In love. Boy, we fooled them, haven't we? Yes, we have. <laughs> a couple of things. Uh, 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 sort of, well, actually. Mm, an apology. An apology. Uh, the last episode, we kept calling Cricket Croquet. No, we called Croquet Cricket. Yes, we called Croquet Cricket. Sorry. They were Croquet Hoops. Yep. We, uh, we know the difference. There's yep. a big difference between the two games. We we recognize that, but wow. But we just got the words mixed up in our mouths. And we asked people uh, what brown sauce was and what uh, if the relish that they're talking about in this episode is actually a... Uh, like a chutney, a not chutney. like a pickle relish that yeah. we would think of that's made out of just pickles, cucumber pickles. Yes. And we were right, turns out. We were correct. Mm-hmm. And best brown sauce I, is like A1. Yeah, the best thing I read was that HP sauce, which is the leading brand of brown sauce in the UK, is like what A1 aspires to be. Oh, fancy. We didn't have a chance to look at the store to see if they have any HP sauce for us to try. I like A1, so I'd be willing to try it. You do? But wow, the idea of putting it on anything other than beef, like a hamburger or a steak, is kind of weird to me. But I'd try it. Do people put it on chicken and stuff? You know, they say on the A1 bottle, like, it's good on this and that and the other. But Maybe nobody pork. uses it for anything other than beef. Maybe pork? Maybe. But HP sauce goes on everything, apparently. Yeah. So it'd be worth a try. HP. Uh, another thing we want to recommend is a video on YouTube that we'll put in the show notes. Uh, by a guy named Charlie Merriman, who he released it last year. It's a funny little video called Midsummer Accidents. It's an in-joke for people who know about Midsummer. Yep. You'll, you'll definitely get a tickle out of it. And we have the next installment of the Midsummer Global Top 50. Top 50. So, What at, number are we at now? Uh, coming in at 29. Mm. Secrets and, Lo and Spies, Season 12, Episode 3. That's the one with Doctor Who is the Spy. Right. Uh, one that I like quite a bit. Uh, Straw Woman, Season 7, Episode 6 that we covered in the podcast already. Mm -hmm. Ep uh, Shot at Dawn, Season 11, Episode 1. The Baguette. Jousting. Jousting. <laughs> 26, A Talent for Life, which was season six, episode one, which is the comic book episode. Mm. 25, Murder for Market, uh, season five, episode one. 24, Small Mercies, season 12, episode five. I thought Small Mercies might have been a top 10 episode. It's the one with the little village. Yeah. And it has that woman in it. What's her name? I don't know. I wasn't prepared for that question. Sorry. It, it has the miniature murder in it. That's 
No, it no. Ha- it has the woman who uh, later went on and won an Oscar. Oh, yeah, whose name I can't remember. But she's in Hot Fuzz, just like half of the cast of this episode. Yes, whatever her name is. <laughs> God, we're horrible. Yes. You gotta prepare better, man. <laughs> Jeez. Just put that one out there. And then you turn to me like, what's her name? Like, I'm supposed to Well, know. no, I know you know her name. No, you, I don't. You've used her name before. Oh, I'm horrible about names. You've used I her. I hardly remember my own name most days. You've used a name before. Yeah. What's your name again? 23, Blood Wedding. Nice. Season 11, episode 2, Cully's Wedding. Which, of course, has to be up there because it's Cully's Wedding. Again, I thought maybe top 10 because of the secret guest star. Not that we're going to spoil an episode of a show from 10 years ago. Yeah, really. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no. No. Oh, it's a good list so, so far. So 23, they're past halfway. Yeah. They're going to get into good episodes, though, now. It's, it's getting tougher to know, to guess what might be up there. Yes, yeah. I would agree. So, Sauce week. Through the Goose, Season 8, Episode 7, filmed January and February 2005, broadcast date 3rd of April 2005, 9.73 million viewers, directed by Rennie Rye and th- written by Alex Andrew Payne. It's the Plumber's Relish episode. It's the Plumber's Relish episode. If you haven't rewatched it lately, that's the one that it is. Yeah. <laughs> the Sauce, in reference. Is Chutney. Yeah. There was, I I thought there was so much more to this episode that there wasn't there. There's only one murder. Yeah. The cast is very small. Yes. And uh, Joyce is really pissed. (laughs) Boy, Joyce is not happy (laughs) in this episode. Butcher bike. That's how we start. There's always an old lady on a trike. Amelia is driving her butcher bike. So this is Amelia Plummer. She's the matron of the family. Right. And she's 467? (laughs) She's not. Okay, we'll figure out how old she is in a second. She's played by Annette Crosby, who is an awesome actress. She's so good in this. Yes, she is. She is genuinely, believably scared. When, When she's sad, when she's talking about her lost love, you feel it. And she's doolally when you know she's not doolally. Yeah, she's convincingly um, sort of doddering, but just enough not that you think maybe she's faking it, which is hard. Like as an actor, to, to act like you're lying but trying not to give it away, that's hard. Yeah. It's like a triple blind she's she is the best actor of the episode she was the voice of granny weatherwax in the cartoon version of the weird sisters which is a pratchett book in 97 and i imagine she was really good at that i've never seen it but she was in this great movie in 1980 called um hawk the slayer hawk the slayer I think I've seen it. It's been voted as one of the worst movies of all time. I think I've seen it. Jack Palance is the villain. Oh, excellent. And I can't think of him and not think of Ripley's Believe It or Or Not. (sighs) He's a heavy breather. Heavy breather, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So Amelia Plummer is the matriarch of the family, of the Plummer family that owns the Plummer's Relish factory. Yes, goods inward, next entrance, office reception only, no entry to tea room shop. Or museum sign is made to look like metal, but it's actually wood. And I went back and looked at it because in the magazine, they say it's a really windy day. That sucker's moving. Oh, yeah. (laughs) This is set in Little Upton. Yep. And we've got a lot to talk about that factory. So I'll table that for now. Okay. Okay. And she goes to an antique shop and steals something. Did you see the unicorn? Yes. That is one wicked, scary unicorn. That was a scary unicorn right at the door. It's outside the door. It's like a carved wood statue. It almost looks like kind of like a chess piece, like a giant chess piece with a unicorn's head on the top, but he's got his tongue out and everything. My note is I would get stuck on that uh, unicorn all the time. You get impaled on it? Yep. (laughs) I think once would probably do it. Well, no, like I catch my coat on it and my belt buckle and stuff like that. Would you rather have that unicorn in the house or um, Mike Spicer's pink penguin in the top? I want that unicorn. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah, he's better. Yep. Yeah, so her deal 
because her kids don't give her enough cash, right? So what she does is she goes into Mr. Judd's antique store and she uh, shoplifts something small. Yep. That is, you know. And everybody knows what's going on here. Yeah. I mean, she doesn't even fake it very well. She's the worst shoplifter ever because they're both in on it. Everybody's in on it. Then Mr. Judd goes to her son, Rafe, and says, you know, she did it again. Yep. She's an old lady. She's a lolly. Yep. And Rafe pays him the price of the item. And then she sells it back to Mr. Judd and he gives her like a seller's value. Yeah. Which is like, you know, 30 or 40 percent of the price. And that's how she makes pocket money. Yes. So she is willing to look as if she is doddering for a little bit of whiskey money. Did you notice she's got a bottle of whiskey next to her kettle? I did. <laughs> the plumbers are the worst family ever. Worst family? Yeah. Like, In what way? They, they, they purposely do not communicate with each other. Well, I think we're supposed to chalk that up to the fact that Maurice, or Morris, spell yes. Maurice, the patriarch who's dead, was a horrible man. And he basically ruined the whole family. Everybody says he's horrible, and he obviously ruined everybody. Yeah, nobody disagrees and defends him. No, no. Uh, and I, I think he set them all on the wrong track. I would agree. And they never really recovered their relationships. But Amelia sees something. She sees the hanging man. I saw something nasty in the woods. Yes. No, she sees, she sees so a dummy from a tree. Yeah, and she, it's clearly a dummy, but she doesn't know what's going on, supposedly. She doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't know if the body's really there, but she does know who it is a reference to. Yes, and it's a reference to Dexter Lockwood's grandfather. Who was the love of her life. Stan or Stanley Lockwood. And he hung himself. Yep. And once you know that that's what it's made to make her think of, it's devastating. It's really sad no wonder she gets so upset i mean if i saw something creepy out the window that was just generically creepy yeah and then it wasn't there i'd be like "Ooh, i'm spooked out i yeah but not only is is it kind of making her think that maybe she has dementia it's making her question herself it's making her think about her dead lover yeah who committed suicide yeah and, and her bad choice that basically ruined her whole life. Yeah. Well, Joyce is packing up the junk. She's redecorating Cully's room. Is she redecorating it for Cully to move back in? I, I don't or know. She Cully's like, in the next episode. Hey, Cully's so. gone, so we can turn I think, her room into something else. I think we've entered into the empty nester phase. Why do you redecorate a room that nobody's using? I don't know. Unless you're turning it into something else. The box says British Association of Removers, pack number two. So this is a moving box from when they moved into this. Yeah. This house. Uh, the British Associate, uh, Association of Removers are dedicated to promoting professional excellence in the removals industry. Are they like the, the movers union? Or something? Yeah. Okay. I like the word removers better. I would like you removed. <laughs> See, I think of something being removed. I think it's not coming back. Not you're moving it to another spot for me. Yeah. You're removing it and taking it away. Removed. So she's she's redecorating Collie's room, but she's also having a clear out, if you haven't noticed. Yeah. Which means she gets to take random things out of kitchen cabinets at the same time, including the really nasty, gross jar of plumber's relish that I, I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole, but Tom claims that he's going to eat from. Okay. Before we get to that, this carpet... She says it's going to be a hundred pounds dearer. So that means it's a hundred pounds more than she originally thought it was going to be. And then she says maybe 200 pounds. What kind of carpet is this? Well, how much do you think it costs to have a, a bedroom carpeted? No, no, no. I think it's a carpet, like a piece of carpet that goes on the floor. A rug? Yeah, like a rug. Oh, no. I think she's talking about a fitted carpet. Okay. Maybe that's better. <laughs> Still dearer. Because you're gonna pay five or six hundred bucks to have a room carpeted. This whole scene, the the whole scene, the packing up of the stuff, the way she talks to Tom, and the way that Tom talks to her, 
is my childhood right there. <laughs> the way he she says dearer is like my mom says dearer, and then he's right into the dad food. <laughs> She's uh, she's in full busy body mode, that's yeah. for sure. So he's going to eat the plumber's relish. And I call it dad food because, like, my dad worked on the railroad, and he used to have, he used to eat blue cheese and sardines. And those were always like, oh, my gosh, old guys eat those things. Now I love blue cheese. You still don't eat sardines. I don't eat sardines, but I know I once I start to eat sardines, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> My dad loves sardines right out of the can with but, a cracker. Yep, but this relish thing, it's a dad food. Because I think it's supposed I mean it's a brand that goes way back, right? He was surprised that they, they're even still making it, yeah. which makes no sense to me whatsoever, considering the factory is like in their backyard. Yes. <laughs> it's within the area that he's in charge of. He would know that factory was still working. Yes. Um, but he, he says his dad had that relish on a sandwich every day at lunchtime. And so it's nostalgia. And she does keep it. She goes, he goes, please keep this old food around. Yeah. And, and she, she goes, says, OK, OK. okay. <laughs> Because she doesn't know that soon it will represent another woman. Yes. Who's going to make her jealous and angry. Ansem arrives. He's fantastic. Let's just talk about Anselm and Caro together. Yeah. First of all, and I apologize. I don't want to insult anyone. But Caro is such a horrible shortening of Carolyn. Oh, it's horrible. And I think it's because in the U.S., the corn syrup brand that you can buy at the store is called Caro Syrup. Yeah. It's with a K. But when I hear Caro, I think yeah. of corn syrup. I'm like, what's wrong with Carolyn? Yeah. It's, well, what is wrong with her Carolyn is that she has interesting hat choices. Wow. These two both are fashion nightmares. And they're just having fun. They're just eating the scenery up the whole oh gosh, way around. They're so fantastic. I hated him so much in the first two minutes. And then every scene he's in, I'm like, you're just so awful. It's awesome. <laughs> like when he opens the door, he's like, you're still here. <laughs> when, once you know that they don't actually accomplish anything bad, they're really fun. They they are the Boris and Natasha of this episode. Oh yeah, that's a good description. She's definitely a Natasha. Yeah, um, but they are the quintessential little brother and sister too. Yeah, because Rafe is the oldest. He's the responsible one. He's the one who you know is supposed to be running the factory. Of course, he's derelict in that, and his wife has to do it. But you know, he's the one keeping the family business together, and all they do is spend the money. They both live in London, live off of relish money, yep. and can never get enough relish money. Well, all the relish money is coming from Asian stereotypes, apparently. <laughs> wow, that tour group is just horrendous. Act as Asian as you possibly can. Yeah. Crowd together and take lots of pictures. It's just so bad. Like, it's surprising they don't have the little da -da 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 music when they show up. Well, and, and you know why the tourist group looks the way that it does? Because it's hard to believe that this relish company could be making enough money to keep this family in the life that they're well, accustomed the, to. The idea is that it's the worldwide market that's doing it. Yeah, that it, an international market has discovered it, and that's now where they make their money. It's not the domestic <laughs> market anymore. So those I don't know how tourists just live on plumber's relish, apparently, and that's why they've come all this way to tour the factory. They have to because I don't know how the, the factory stays in business. I don't know how the family stays in business. I don't know how the cheese shop stays in business or the tea shop stays in business. <laughs> I certainly don't know how the museum stays in business. <laughs> All of these people working with one security guard who will get to. <laughs> there's a reason there's only one security guard. Okay. I'll tell you in a second. Okay. And yet they seem completely out of money all the time. A lot of families are like that. That all of their money has to be reinvested in their property and in the company 
and they don't have any ready cash. They have lots of assets, but no ready cash. Yeah. And the boilers are going bad. Right. Because they have human bits in them. It's a factory that's been around for a long time, and so yeah. it's antiquated. It's. It, I mean, they've got a switchboard in the lobby. Yeah. So that switchboard in the lobby is just beautiful. It it would have been uh, like when the phone system was originally installed. They would have had one number come to the the main office, and then sh- whoever was working in the office would move. They would unplug the wire yeah. and plug it plug into in the in. right one. Yeah. yeah, like an old phone operator, yeah. right? It's just so. on a smaller scale. This, this episode and King's Crystal are kind of the same. Yeah, except the workers here don't. Aren't revolt. revolt. Yeah. <laughs> so th- there's a, okay, there's something that always annoyed me about this episode. And it's one of those things, well, yeah, they couldn't do that because it would completely undermine the plot. Yeah. But if I were the plumbers yes. and I gave tours like this, I would give those people different colored hat and coats. Yes. So I could spot them in the factory so they don't just become another person in a white coat and hat. Now, have you ever gone on a factory tour? No. Okay. So oh, I take that back. Hershey, Pennsylvania. But it's a fake factory tour. It's like a pretend factory. Oh, you, you didn't tell me this because my tour is Hershey in Smith Falls. Oh. Hershey in Canada, uh, the chocolate maker, had a factory in Smith Falls where I was born, actually. Not in the factory, but... <laughs> you were born in a chocolate factory? <laughs> Did you born. come out of a kinder egg or I something? I was born in a chocolate factory. <laughs> um, and we used to go there every year for tours, and you get chocolate at the end of it. It was awesome. Oh, Hershey, Pennsylvania is like an amusement park about chocolate. <laughs> we saw candy being made. <laughs> well, this factory... The outside shots, yeah, right, are of a place called the Maltings in Amersham. Okay, and the Maltings is uh, it was initially built in the Tudor era and has been around for a long, long time, and it is really shaped like a horseshoe. Okay, um, and it's called the Maltings because it originally it was a factory that turned barley into malt. Okay. And that's why there are a lot of outbuildings because they would have had like silos and tanks and holding pens and airing pens. And the second floor of all those buildings were widower's cottages. Oh. So if your husband worked at the Maltings and he died, they would let you live there. Oh. As a widow, you would have a place to live. And that that was really nice. Except for, boy, it would stink there. I don't know what it would smell like. I, I expect um, malt has a nice smell to it. I think maybe it smelled like It'd be beer. Different if it was hops. Yeah. Hops stink. Yeah. But malt maybe. Barley doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so the fa- the family who built it ran it for a really long, long time. Yeah. And then they sold it, and they've sold it, and I think now it's owned by the council of that area. Okay. And it's actually up for redevelopment now. Oh. Which is nice. And we'll post a link to this because they've put a PDF online of kind of like, this is a great development opportunity and somebody should pitch a proposal for it. But because it's kind of horseshoe shaped, all they had to do was put the plumber's relish sign up over the entrance. Yeah. There really is that one entrance in and out. So one yeah. guard. Yeah, that makes could, sense. Could keep an eye on it. Now, well, actually, I know about that, and I bought that property. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you only buy you, you domain names. Don't don't get no, pricey on me. I, I didn't buy that um, property. Though I did buy something, and I'm about to tell you. The inside of the factory yeah. is shot at a completely different place. Yes. It's the Tip Tree Jam Factory. Okay. It is, is that why all the, all the relish in the warehouse looks like jam? And why it doesn't have any labels on it. Yes. Right? Because yeah. that's, yeah, that's jam. It doesn't look anything like the jar that... Oh, I think it looks similar enough. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I do. But um, it is different colors. Yeah. When they're in the warehouse, you notice that some of the flats are like an orange and some are kind of a red. Yeah, that's because it's jam. Not... That's because Tip Tree is known for marmalade. They're yeah. known for this Tip Tree strawberry... Scarlet something strawberry jam. Mm. They do make a chutney. Okay. That's called Tip Tree Relish. Yes. And it, and I'm sorry, it's called class, their classic chutney. Okay. That is absolutely the same thing as Plumber's Relish. Okay. Without the tomatoes. They make okay. another one that has tomatoes in it. 
Okay. Anyhow, this place is humongous. Okay. I don't know how many factories they have, but they have 12 tea rooms around the UK. Jesus. That they run. Wow. It's like restaurants. Yeah. In all these scenic, beautiful places. Oh. But I was curious, and so uh, I, I went on their website, and I ordered some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what did you? I'm looking at it, I'm like, wow, that marmalade looks really good. They have a marmalade that has whiskey in it. Oh. that tastes, that would be really good. And they have a raspberry champagne Ooh, preserve. Yeah. So like, yeah, I want some of that. And they had lemon curd and lime curd and grapefruit curd. And, oh, yeah, I want some of that. So How, how much money do we owe these people now? We won't talk about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> but soon we will get to try some of that. Okay. Yeah, so two different locations for this shoot um, for the factory itself, which I think makes a lot of sense because when you're inside the factory, it's very modern, very white, clean. So the outfit they wear is the sort of stock workman outfit. Why a hairnet and a hat? I don't know, but the hats are always, it, it's, it always is like, I'm going to put this dashing hat on. <laughs> they do look better than just a hairnet. Yeah. I'll give them that. But wow. <laughs> and the little white coats make them look very, I don't know, Oompa Loompa like, like very business. Yeah. Serious. It's business. People moving around. Rafe's not at the factory, though. No, because he's always out in Albert Wood looking at birds. Now, is he a birder or a bird watcher? He's not a twitcher. Yes. He's a bird watcher. Yes. <laughs> Not one of those annoying Twitcher people just checking people things off a list. And we meet Sam and Sonia in the office. Well, they're the parents of Alex. It's who really is just Hard angry all the time. It's the Hardwick family who have yes. worked there forever. Who I thought were the murderers. And I understand why. I understand why. Yeah. They're not the murderers, but I spend the whole rest of the first viewing going, Am I sure they're the murderers? They're extremely dedicated to the business and to the family. So I yeah. wouldn't have put it past them. Yeah. And they do help. They do try to help cover it up. They do. So they, they are that dedicated, but they didn't, they no. didn't commit the murder. Um, Sam Hardrick, uh, he looks uh, familiar. Yeah, because he's also in Garden of Death. He's the crazy neighbor with the naked ladies in his house. Mm-hmm. Yep. He's much more likable in this episode. Sam Hardwick is played by David Ross. Yep. Uh, and he's been in a lot of things. He's a character actor in the UK. Um, I was excited to see that he was the original actor who played Crichton, the robot in Red Dwarf. Oh, I didn't know that. So Crichton, you probably know him if you've ever watched Red Dwarf as Robert Llewellyn. Who yeah. Played him the major. I mean, you know, most of it, all of it. Yeah. Um, but uh, David Ross played him first when he was, Crichton was supposed to be just an occasional character and then mm -hmm. people really liked him. So they wanted to make him a full-time character and David Ross was busy. So they hired Robert Llewellyn to play him instead. Maybe he was doing some Midsummers. No, nah, it would have been a little early for that, but yeah. Yeah. But he was, he was first. No. Yeah. He's pretty good too. I watched a clip. Yeah. It's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Okay, she's got to get her skates on. Did you notice that she said that? Yeah. That's weird. Like, what does that mean? Like, she needs to get her roller skates on to yeah. get there faster? Yeah. Okay. It's the annual general meeting. The AGE. Yeah. No, the AGM. AGM, sorry. Yes. Yeah. I love how through this episode, and they just touch on it here, that the, the plumber's relatives, right, came back from India. With this recipe. They were in the Punjab. In the Punjab, yeah. which is in northwestern Italy. Yeah. Uh, uh, India. India. Right on the border with Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Right. Then later on, Helen is like, oh, no. Yeah, he poisoned <laughs> half the staff. <laughs> the secret recipe that he brought back was inedible. Yeah. And, and his the, cook made up a better one. And that's the one they and use. And that's the one they use. They do such a great job of creating history for this relish company well the the ads for the relish company now these are beautifully hand-painted ads and, but they do look like period ads they do and they're all over the office and they just look beautiful and they're all over the, ca I, the little cafe i and... would definitely want one of those ads <laughs> you want a plumber's relish yeah I, I definitely want a plumber's relish ad 
I think basically what they did was they looked up some kind of chutney company that had been around at the time and they just copied, copied their ads. ads and swapped out the name yeah, because they, they could do that. so much of the era. Yeah, they do. Some of them are even old and racist. Yes, you know? I noticed that. Yeah. So. so the general meeting, everybody shows up. Now, this is where, okay, I get confused. All right. Because... I think this is earlier in the in the day than it actually is. You thought it was earlier in the day. I the thought AGM it was morning. Four. The AGM starts at four. Okay. We hear that later. I don't know why they start an AGM at four. No one knows. Because ever... it's tea time. Okay. I want my chocolate biggies. <laughs> That's the only way they can get Rafe to show up is to lure him with cookies. Otherwise, he just sits in his hide and makes baked beans. Yeah, gosh. I get the sense that he loves that hide because that's where he was able to get away from his dad. I think so, too. He talks about his dad to Barnaby there. It wasn't a space he shared with his dad. No. It was his escape it was his from escape. his dad. Ansem is smoking indoors. Ansem is wearing polo attire to a meeting. No, but the smoking indoors really dated this show. That and Sonia quickly puts an ashtray down before he just ashes on the table because he's yes. going to, even without the ashtray. And we find out about Carolyn's cookbook <laughs> and her novel. And her novel, it takes priority. She really gets on my nerves. I'm better since together they're funny alone. I just want to strangle her. Since I gave up dairy. She's just a caricature. It's so, so awesome. bad. And clearly, Fieldway, the, Fieldway Foods is making overtures towards plumbers. And because Caro and Anselm just want money, yep. period, and they don't care whether it's a sustainable source of money or not, they want to sell. They want to take money out of the business. And at this point, Helen looks like a very responsible kind, tolerant person. She's married to Rafe, who's never around. Yep. And who would rather look at birds and talk to her or run the business. It makes her lonely. She tolerates Caro and Anselm. Yep. And keeps everything afloat, even though takes she's not care, a plumber. Takes care of her mother-in-law. Yeah. Even yep. though she's not a plumber and it's not her responsibility. No. Too bad she's loony. Yeah. Too bad she's a killer. She makes Dexter brown bread. <laughs> And some girls, great uh, daddy brown bread. I laughed when they said that because normally the jam would be between the bread, but they put him between the jam. Oh! oh. <laughs> she also says that uh, <laughs> later Helen says that Dexter ran off like a scalded cat. Yeah. Which I think is in really bad taste. <laughs> Considering he ends up in the sterilizer. I, d I did say that. <laughs> like, that's a sign that she's not as sensitive as she pretends to be. Yeah. So they have a vote and the two younger siblings lose because uh, Amelia, who is playing Doolally, suddenly makes the right decision. Yeah. But then Helen says um, that it's carried. And it's actually defeated. Yes. It's opposite. She's opposite. Yes. Then the time issues begin. Okay. Because Mr. Judd comes to get his money. Right. Right at the end of the AGM. So let's say the AGM's an hour. We'll give them a gift. It's five o'clock. Five o'clock. The tour is still going on. How big is this factory? I don't know. It starts at four. Yes. Right? The same yeah. time as the AGM. So... Helen and Rafe go looking around the factory because they're going to meet Dexter. Well, Rafe's going to meet Dexter. Rafe is going to meet Dexter. At the Helen warehouse. Helen is going to check things out. Yes. She's just going to look around at the end of the day. Because she knows how to do everything she at the factory. She actually runs the business. Yes. So she's checking on stuff and she sees him and then chases him into the warehouse where yeah. he's going to meet Rafe anyway. Yes. Rafe's having a chitty chat with him because, you know, Dexter's got these glasses on. Rex that, Specs. That hide his identity completely. Completely. If only he had a little mustache, too. <laughs> no one will ever recognize me in this hat. <laughs> so he, Dexter goes, says something to somebody. 
He's talking to Rafe. And then somebody else uses the forklift. So there has to be two killers at this point in time. You know that. Right. Okay. And it makes a heck of a mess. There's chutney and blood everywhere. Yeah, because she runs into him with the forklift, shoving him into a flat. Lifting him off the ground. And crushes him between them. Yes. Enough that it breaks as many jars as he is high and wide, both yeah. behind and in front. So he dies from asphyxiation or and internal crushing injuries. crushing injuries. Right. Right. And then they just go home. Well, first of all, Dexter's dumb. He deserves to die because he doesn't know how to go left or right. Yes. Because all he had to do was step left or right. There's a little problem of him moving moving diagonally. (laughs) So Rafe didn't intend to kill him. No. Helen comes in and decides, I'm going to kill him. Why doesn't Rafe save him? Uh, Rafe doesn't do anything, honey. No, he He doesn't. act. He's... He's horrible. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, he just steps aside and lets things happen. That's what he does, right? So, Helen kills him. So, they must agree, okay, the warehouse guy left it too. We know that. So, we'll just leave the body between these two racks of jars. Yes. We'll go establish alibis other places, and we'll come back later tonight and get rid of his body. Yes. And at no point is Rafe going, what did you do, woman? No. No. Because it may have been that he always kind of wanted to do that. Maybe. Because he is yelling at Dexter. I was surprised when they do the reenactment of how the crime yeah, happened. Yeah, he's yelling he's at saying, Dexter. you stay away from my mother because yeah. Dexter had Amelia Wright sign an enduring power of attorney and Rafe has found out. Yeah. He is angry and raising his voice. But not. But like not the most emotion we see from Rafe in the whole episode. Not killing with autumnal goodness. Rafe Plummer is played by James Fleet. Who, for me, was first known for Four Weddings and a Funeral. Yes. Uh, he, he was in Four Weddings and a Funeral. He's married to Jane Booker, who played Laura Hutton, the Writers Club secretary in Written in Blood. Oh, okay. They've been married for forever. Oh, okay. I can imagine them as yeah. a couple. Totally. He was also in a few things with Don French. They're good friends. He was in Murder Most Horrid, which is a a Don French show where every episode is a different murder mystery that makes fun of a different element of murder detective shows. Cool. (laughs) They're like one-offs kind of. Yeah. But he was also in Vicar of Dibley for years. Yeah. Years and years. And he's Uncle Carter in the new Partners in Crime, the new Tommy and Tuppence. Yes, he is. Yeah. He he plays their uncle. He... (laughs) In the, they did a reprise of Four Weddings and a Funeral for a short, and he has the most fantastic beard and mustache. He is full beard and mustache now. It's a beautiful beard and mustache. Yeah. They did like a wedding reception. Yeah. It made me cry. That yeah. movie makes me cry every single time oh, I see it. It's a good movie. It makes me cry. He ends up happy as opposed to almost everybody else. Yeah, really. that. <laughs> so Dexter's dead. And they've got to do something about it. Okay, so we're going to leave it there till we find out more details. Well, the rest of the episode is all about Ansem's horrible pants. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. That's His most- job purse? No, the job purse are the best pants he wears. <laughs> His other pants? He Doesn't he wear like mom jeans at one point? Huh? And these atrocious plaid pants. With oh, that that's, no right. Co- that's right. That's right. That's right. Several times. And then he has on this jumper that has a turtleneck and stripes, but he wears it under a plaid jacket with tweed pants that aren't the same. Pl- I mean, it's just it, you have to go to an effort to look that bad. <laughs> I mean, Caro just wears black. Yeah. Now, granted, she wears sunglasses inside in the dark. Cons- care. The picture of her in the magazine of has she's sunglasses, sunglasses on. on. But his clothes. Wow. Yeah. Never mind that. They could recoup a ton of money for ready cash if all they did was sell the Bentley that Rafe drives. Yeah, to and from the house. the To the factory. To the factory and to the hide. Which is like an eighth of a mile. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. It's a beautiful Bentley. Yeah, but they could easily get half a million dollars for that. He could ride the bike. Not yes. that much. Uh. 
Two fifty. Two fifty. That's what I found when I looked it up. So Scott's interviewing a young lady, <laughs> and her name is Claire Hockley. Holly, sorry. She was born on the twenty uh, sixth of July, nineteen seventy six. Okay. And she's five five, and okay. from Coston. It's all on the form. Because he's doing interviews in the factory. Yeah. But you know what else is on the form? What? Freddie Bonavita's rap sheet. Why? I don't know. <laughs> they reused this piece of paper. Remind us who Freddie Bonavita is. Freddie Bonavita is the husband of the killer in the regatta episode. Yes. <laughs> so they just grabbed a piece of paper and reused it. Yes. It includes, or maybe Freddie did it. <laughs> He's back from wherever Gibraltar. I don't know. He went because it's a piece of paper. I stop and I'm reading of it. Of course you do. And then I'm like, Freddie Bonavita. <laughs> is he an investor in plumbers? The whole bottom half of the page is Freddie Bonavita's rap sheet. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have any CCTV because they've had to make economies, so they stopped putting tapes in the CCTV. What has that saved him? Four pounds <laughs> a year? Well, you know, they have a security guard. Maybe if they let go of one of the tea room, the shop, or the museum, or the tours, they could recoup enough money to put a VCR tape in. Yes. So now we find Dexter, and he is not where we left him in the warehouse. No, he's in the bottle sterilizer. He's in the bottle sterilizer. Which is a real piece of equipment. Yeah. It does exactly what they say it does. You put a bunch of bottles in it and they sterilize. Yes. And that actor goes through that sterilizer partially. Yeah, but not when it's on. There's water on him. Yeah, but not hot water. No, it's just regular water. It's just water. It's not not scalding water. (laughs) Okay, Bob, we're going to want you to get in this machine. (laughs) His name is Rod Hallett, the actor's name. Um, It's not 200 degrees centigrade. No. Which is what they... Claim. Which would burn your skin off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it would be a, a molten lump of meat on the other side. Yep. This As is... is, his skin's all like shiny and puckered up and red. And they do a really good job with his burns. The makeup artists do a really good job. Yep. But this is another episode with prolonged naked dude. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's a lot of Dexter butt. Yes, a lot of Dexter butt. And a lot of Georgie making jokes. Yeah. This is one for the memoirs. <laughs> Whose? Yours and mine. <laughs> well, and when George shows up with, with the crime scene guys, it's like an army of geriatric crime scene guys. They're all like five million years old. And like five feet tall wearing yeah. their little blue suits. They're all little Georges. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the guy who goes through the ashes, I thought it was George at first. And then he turns around. I'm like, no, it's a clone of George. Yep. It's George's buddy. So they go to find out who's in charge, and Helen totally downplays her role. I'm just the secretary. Yes. Alex, the production man. And then, like, for no reason at all, Scott and Alex get into it about closing the factory. Some guy died in your machine, okay? Yeah, you've got bigger problems than not being able to make relish today, buddy. Yeah. Nobody's going to want to eat your relish ever again. It's got... Dexter bits in it. <laughs> At least that's what people are going to think. Would you buy something from a factory that you knew somebody had died in the machinery? No. I, no. I, there are other choices to put on your sandwich. Mayo. Yeah. Mayo's good. <laughs> and and like out of obligation, Rafe shows up like, oh, somebody died. Well, they have to go get him. I guess I'll go. <laughs> and as soon as he can, he's like, Okay, well, I'll let you take it from here and grab a couple of biscuits and head out. I actually thought at that point in time, I'm like, is he autistic? <laughs> like, he he acts not as a joke autistic, but he acts like he can't read the situation at all. He, he's just so removed from reality. Yeah. And they've let him. Then they take the sign from the front and they move it to where the office is. Exact same side. So it can be in more shots. Yep. When Tom goes to see George in the mortuary. Yeah. 
Is that the first time we've ever seen Tom in scrubs? I think it is. He looks good in his scrubs. It's Tom. He looks good in everything. Because George has always got a little bit of chest hair showing at the top of his scrubs. He he does. Manly, you know. Yeah. Georgie. Tom kind of pulls it off, too, even in the bonnet. He even looks good in the bonnet. Yep. Handsome dude. They also go to see the security guard. Keith. But I don't care about Keith. All I care about is Jackie. (laughs) His wife. (laughs) Those people don't owe you anything. Two seconds later, they still don't owe you anything. (laughs) Is that the only line you have, lady? Never mind that they're living in a a beautiful cottage. Yes, it is on the grounds of the relish factory, but I'm sure they get it for free. And so we find out that at midnight, he found Ansem with his hands in the the safe. safe. The safe that's supposed to hold the secret recipe. Which Ansem was going to sell. Yeah. But the recipe, of course, is in the banking costume, where it should be. That's the only legitimate thing that they actually do (laughs) business-wise in this whole episode. It's not there. Keith Carter, the security guard, is played by Steve Spears. Um, He was in Pirates of the Caribbean. He was in Inkheart. He was in Star Wars Phantom Menace. He's been in lots and lots of things. Yeah. Over half of his roles, they've got prosthetics on him to make him look like some kind of orc. Yeah. But he has a brother that... They're not twins, but man, they look really close. Yeah. His brother is an opera singer. Oh, sweet. So just imagine Keith singing opera. Wow. And you got it. Wow. They're the same size, same build, same everything. He's fantastic. He's really good. He's a tenor. Wow. While they're at the factory, they find a car key. The George clone. Because. The most indestructible car key ever. Dexter's clothes are gone, right? So we know that Dexter was not in the machine at midnight. Okay. So he was in the warehouse at six Mm -hmm. and not in the machine at midnight. Right. Okay. Okay. It's all coming together here. Because right around, um, let's say 1230 when Anselm leaves. Yeah. Keith runs him off. He starts to do his rounds. Yes. And that is when Helen and Rafe have decided to come back and get rid of Dexter's body. Because normally, Keith is asleep. He doesn't really do his job. So they dress up in dark clothing and... No, no, no. They put on their factory jackets and hats and hairnets. What? (laughs) But not gloves. Okay, so they take the body out and... No, no. They put him in the sterilizer after stripping him naked. Why do they strip him naked? To disguise who he is. (laughs) But they didn't cut off his hands or anything. No. Right? So they throw his clothes and wallet and keys into the incinerator, which apparently was running last night, but but this morning is cool enough for an old dude to scour around in it. Yeah. Why didn't they put him in the incinerator? So tell me about the incinerator butt crack here. Oh, it's the sterilizer butt crack. Yeah, sterilizer okay. butt crack. We're going out of order here, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So We only have one murder. I know. So we know that Rafe and Helen stripped Dexter, put his stuff in the incinerator, and put his body in the sterilizer. Now, why they would put him in the sterilizer, I do not understand, because their entire livelihood relies on this business, and putting him in a piece of equipment in the business is only going to damage them. In the flashback, that that actor has very little clothes on. He he has no clothing on. Okay. Okay. He has very little clothing on. And there is a scene. And they're manhandling him. And it's the actors. Yes. It's not. Where Rafe and Helen are actually moving Dexter further in to the sterilizer. Yes. We don't see them lift him off the floor. No. But he's partially in and they manhandle him in. Yes. And in the recreation, when they're going over what actually happened and we see them do this. I saw this because, of course, apparently I was staring at Dexter's butt crack. Well, it's right there. Uh, I saw this little flash of white in his butt crack. (laughs) Okay. I'm like, okay, what's that? (laughs) Because I'm weird. Yep. So I rewinded a little bit. The kids thought I was nuts, by the way, when I was doing this. I was doing it in the living room on the big TV because I need to see it big, right? And I'm like, 
what was that? And I rewind it. It took me three times. Okay. Like, ha ha, Dexter's got on a thong. Yep. <laughs> Dexter has a thong. Dexter's midnight thong. Yes. So then I'm like, okay, so is this something that actors do? Because I know they have like flesh toned clothes that they might wear. Like if it's a nude scene, but it's kind of out of focus, sometimes they'll give them like, um, nude, like skin toned underwear yep. that they can kind of hide. Or nowadays it's much more likely they're wearing very green underwear yes. and they green screen them out. Yeah. But this is not high tech like that. No, no. Okay. What Dexter is wearing, what poor Rod Hallett, the actor is wearing. Yes. is called a modesty pouch. Okay. Okay. A modesty pouch is the male version. The female version is called a modesty patch. Okay. All right. The modesty pouch, the male version, is also referred to as a cock sock. Yes. <laughs> Banana hammock. Uh, no, they actually call it that um, because in its simplest form, it is a bag with a drawstring that you put around your junk yeah. and tie up. Yep. Yeah. So that nobody can see it and it can't touch anything. Okay. Dexter's is a little bit more advanced than that. Okay. It has straps sort of, it's like a thong, right? Mm. So it's got a string that goes from the pouch in the front. Yes. Uh, around your waist. Okay. And then back to it between your legs. Okay. It had to have been really uncomfortable. I can only imagine. He probably would have rather have just been naked. I, yeah. Wow. That could not feel good. No, And then get sprayed with water. And he doesn't move. No. Those jets of water come on and I would be like, whoa. <laughs> well, they're mist. Yeah, but still he's got to, like, he doesn't react to it at all. At least he's uh, aiming away, right? We, we're only looking at his back, so... Even if he makes a face, we wouldn't know. But he's extremely still. Rod Hallett is a fantastic dead body actor. He's yep. not the best actor actor. Oh, it gets worse for Rod. Okay. Okay. So the prosthetics they have on him to make him look burned, it's a latex that's uh, kind of clear, really. Yeah. When it dries, it's a very thin skin latex. And that's why he looks so burnt. Right. It makes your skin look... Um, shiny, and it also, as it dries, it draws itself up so it can look kind of puckered. Okay. Right? So they've got that on him, as well as some kind of like red and pink paint to mm -hmm. make his skin look scalded. It, some of the best makeup. But unlike spirit gum that can be removed with like an adhesive remover, like an alcohol will dissolve it and, and yeah. come right off, that kind of latex that they use for burns, it doesn't. It's like, it's rubber. Okay. So you can't dissolve it so much as you just have to peel it off. Oh. And when you peel it off, it takes all the hair with it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's on his ass, on his thighs, yeah. on his back. Yeah. So he probably had to be shaved first all well, over. There, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Then they made him put on his little modesty pouch, and he probably had to wear that while they were brushing it on. And then it has to dry, and you can't touch it while it's drying. So it's not like he could put a robe on while it was drying. Nope. He had to stand around wearing his little pouch while it dried. Now, you can blow dry it. When I use latex out in the garage, sometimes yeah. I blow dry it. Um, at some point, I should probably explain why I do that. Um <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just use latex in the garage. Um, so the poor man had to stand for probably 30 minutes or so while that stuff dried. Oh. And then they put him in rec specs when he's got clothes on. And then they put the ugly specs on him. But the, And then these two actors have to manhandle him. Yeah. And then he has to get wet. Oh. Like, it's just, he's a sport. Dead body of the episode, for he sure. Is, he's the only dead body in the <laughs> So you want to you want him to compete against the dummy that hangs from the tree? <laughs> yeah. Speaking of the dummy that hangs from the tree, we find out that Dexter Lockwood's dad is doing this. Yes. Who is Derek, Derek Lockwood. Lockwood. And we have a couple of scenes with him. The first one, he's just upset about his boy. And I'm spending the whole time going, you're the guy from Hot Fuzz who mumbles. Yes. <laughs> you can't get it out of your head. Yeah. Hey. yeah. There are 14 actors who are in Midsummer and in Hot Fuzz. Wow. 
He's only one. Another <sighs> weird one. I didn't mention this earlier. Um, Mr. Judd is played by John Quayle. Okay. He's one of only two actors who were in Midsummer and Benny Hill. Ooh. <laughs> we'll get to the other one in another episode. Okay. But um, Carl Johnson, who plays Derek Blackwood, he was also in Lark Rise to Candleford, which I really liked. Yes. Um, he was in Rome. Yes. So, so in Rome, he played, what was his name? Oh, palace or he's a he's a uh, a counselor yes and he says this line <laughs> that we glued on to he says you lost rome right so if you haven't seen rome it's one of the early hbo shows mm. right and it is the story of caesar julius caesar who's played by the guy who's in Game of Thrones. One of those guys. One of those guys. And so it's all this political intrigue, but it's all about uh, the fall of uh, the fall of Rome. Yeah. Right. And when he says you lost Rome, because <laughs> first of all, all these people speak in their British accents. Right. And Carl Johnson, I, I couldn't find any documentation that he has had a stroke. No, but he does have an affect with his face where half of his face is a bit slack. And I don't know if, if it's an acting thing that he does or if it's actually the way because he does it in hot fuzz. Right. too. It, I don't know if it's the way his face actually moves. Yeah. But regardless, when he says you lost Rome, he looks like Popeye. He looks like Popeye. And so in our family, it's you lost Rome. <laughs> Anyway, we've gone way off there. Uh, Carl Johnson apparently was friends with Derek Jarman. Okay. Do you know who Derek Jarman is? No. Okay, you should. Okay. He directed all the music videos for the Pet Shop Boys. Okay. And all the music videos for the Smiths. Oh, my gosh. And then he made weird movies. Okay. And Carl Johnson was in them. Okay. Like Wittgenstein. In 1993. Okay. Are you familiar with this? No, I'm not. It's the story of Wittgenstein. Okay. And Carl plays Wittgenstein. Okay. Um, throughout his life. But imagine... Oh, what was the movie we talked about last week? That Listomania. Had, yeah, okay. So it's like that, but oh, about Wittgenstein. Why have I not seen this movie? Um, he's also in another Derek Jarman movie called Jubilee. Have you ever heard of Jubilee? That sounds more familiar. 1978? Yeah. Let me read you the two-sentence synopsis of this film. Okay. Queen Elizabeth I travels 400 years into the future to witness the appalling revelation of a dystopian London overrun by corruption and a vicious gang of punk guerrilla girls led by the new monarch of punk. No. I'm and gonna... it's black and white. Oh, my gosh. I should see this movie. Right away. Yeah. And again, starring role. Yeah. <laughs> What else has he done? Oh, and, Derek German? Yeah. Oh, tons. I need tons to see, of weird. I need to see all his weird. Yeah. If listeners, if you've seen either of this movie or another Derek German movie, let us know. Yeah. But Carl Johnson, I mean, we think of him as kind of the old guy, and yeah. and he's had a long career. He was born in 1948. And wow. And he's been acting since he was like 12. Yeah. Um. But yeah, he did some experimental stuff when he was a little bit younger. Ooh. So, okay. So Derek Lockwood yep. is Dexter's dad, right? Yes. And the whole, the whole theme here is that Derek works for Fieldway Foods. He's involved in industrial espionage kind of stuff. Yep. Uh, Dexter, sorry. Derek helped him. They were trying to scare Amelia. Yep. And the reason why it bothered her so much is that she had been in love with Stan Lockwood. Yes. Who had worked at the factory, but she wound up marrying Morris instead. And then Stan was fired and hung himself. And when I was thinking about how this episode could be different, I actually thought like maybe Dexter could have been her son. And then I was like, 
No, there's a whole weird generational thing. Here. Right. Because she was in love with Dexter's grandfather. Yeah. So Amelia is 470 years old. <laughs> Well, Annette Crosby, who plays Amelia, was born in 1934. Yeah. Carl Johnson, who's Derek Lockwood, who's the son of the man she was in love with, was born in 1948. So if their characters are the same age as the actors, she's 14 years older than him. Which is weird. Which is not enough for her to have been in love with his dad. No. Unless no. he was a cradle robber. Yeah. There, There's... They That's should have weird. picked an actor for Derek that looked a little bit younger. Yeah. Or Tom's age. And then we yeah. could believe it. Yeah. You know, more mid to late 50s. Maybe. Rather than 70s. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I was so excited by those movies that Carl Johnson was in. I'm like, whoa, this is weirder than the last one. <laughs> so Scott's eating some of this stuff and he calls it autumnal. Well, it's because it's got ginger and cinnamon. Yep. Turmeric he picks out. Yes. I'm quite impressed that he can identify turmeric. He he is quite the palate. It also has onions, tomatoes, dried mushrooms. It's got a little bit of everything but the kitchen sink in it. Yeah. Which it would. But and tomatoes. Yeah. The tomatoes, onions, and mushrooms I don't get. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway. So we know that Ralph has had Amelia sign an enduring power of attorney. And then we find out that Dexter had her sign one a month yes. later. Yes. Like within the last month. And we find that out when Scott finds the hanging man in the bin. Along with the plumber's business file that Dexter was keeping. Yes. Kids must have put that there. <laughs> yeah. Derek is not the best liar. Did you know that? Notice any of the others, Dexter's other files? No. One of them says Plumber's AGM on it. <laughs> <laughs> if he has the notes for the AGM, I think this is a little more beyond espionage. And why did he only throw away one of his plumber's files? Yeah, why did his dad do that? No. What was on the disc? The CD that they take out of his computer? The stuff about the sale and the rezoning of Albert's Woods. But that wasn't in the file. No. It was on a CD. Yes. A CD-ROM. In his fancy computer. Computer. Okay. Tom goes to the two beer, the two brewers pub with Helen. Helen. She doesn't want to talk to him at the factory. This scene makes me upset. Yes. Because Scott is also there with Caro. Yes. Who, good for him. He cottons on to her real fast. And he's like, oh, you're giving me information that's useful. I'm a policeman. And she's like, but I, I want you to, you know, you can't, you can't talk like Caro and not, you know, make your face into like a little pouty lip thing. Ugh. But I thought you were here to talk about my novels. So we find out that Helen knows how to drive a forklift. She worked in the factory from the bottom up and she did every single job. Now, at this point, <laughs> that yeah. was my Caro impersonation. <laughs> At this point in time, I am remember I am reminded that this is not called Midsummer Mysteries. It's called Midsummer Murders. Because at this point, everybody is pointing at Helen. Yeah. She seems to be the only one who actually cares about whether the business yes. lives and is enough to do something about it. So it's gotta be about that. Right? Yep. Yeah. And Tom talks about his dad. Scotch bonnets. <sighs> He was so disappointed when he found out they weren't hats. Yes. He's an idiot. He was little. I guess. But he puts her coat on and like lingers on the lapel. Oh, and I'm like, uh, okay, first of all, Tom, ew. And yeah. second of all, Scott's right there. What yeah. do you think you're doing? It's just wrong. It's, it shouldn't it be It doesn't either. work. I'm with Joyce. I'm upset. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. She's not particularly attractive. She's not particularly charming. She's like a, 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 a really conservative school marm in her twin set and pearls constantly. Yep. 
When people sort of think he has the hots for that psychiatrist in the episode with the ropes course, yep. I can sort of see how when he was younger and she was an expert giving testimony that he would have admired her and That's stuff different. because she was accomplished and things. But Helen has nothing going for her. And he says her pretty little head. I'm like, Tom is never going to say that. No, 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 I don't. Anywho, then that's over. Yeah. She goes away. Joyce is upset. I didn't know what it was when I made it. <laughs> or it's been so long ago since I made it. And then she gets upset because he doesn't notice her new reading glasses, which she's wearing while she eats. Are they sexy? Joyce, don't say that word. Ew. Oh. It's like your mom saying, do these look sexy? Yep. No, because oh, they're on you, mom. Gosh. No. Plus, why are you wearing your reading glasses while you're eating dinner? Why are you wearing them way up on your nose like they're regular glasses? So then they've... So I sympathize. Yes. When he's on a case, he is inattentive at best. Yes. He is listening, we know, because later he knows exactly what color she's talking about. Yes. I might have said the same thing. If we'd sat down at dinner and I had on new glasses and I said, didn't you notice my new glasses? It just doesn't need to be there. They're the couple that get along. Yeah. I don't like any hint that they don't get along. Yeah. They're mom and dad. They're reliable. Yep. So they've got it figured out but the glasses in are the, the warehouse. Big, the big clue, right? The big, ah, because the there's this weird shot when Amelia drops her glasses. This bird's eye view shot, which are usually done only outside. A bird's eye shot inside is a very strange shot. I think it's the only angle they could use to show her glasses falling on the ground. It's just it's a so, tight space. It comes so. out of nowhere and it's sudden. But she, because he puts the EPA down that she signed for Dexter Lockwood, and I yeah. think she sort of blocked it out. Yeah. Right? And now she's well, confronted Well, she also it. is like, oh, I'm going to act too loudly because it's somebody's convenient. caught me up. If she pretends to be suffering from dementia, yeah. she can get out of everything, whatever, get away from situations that she doesn't like being in. And I don't blame her for that, but yeah. So when... When Joyce says, don't you like my new glasses? He thinks of her glasses, and then he thinks of Dexter's glasses, and doesn't just think, huh, I wonder if they melted in the incinerator. No. He thinks, no, they're the key. Somebody picked them up and put them in their pocket. Whoever's pocket they're and in is they the They must have forgotten them. Why? <laughs> Helen has done nothing but show us that she is meticulous, yeah. organized, and... And it assumes that they would put on their white coats and hats to move the body, oh. which we know doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Unless they're disposable, but they're not. They have their names embroidered on them. So they let it be known that the coat has the glasses in it. Mm -hmm. And then there has to be the strangest meeting ever. And this meeting is between Rafe and possibly Helen and Sam, Sonia, and Alex. I think he just talked to Sam. I think he said, Sam, my buddy, my pal, you've been the rock for our family. I need a favor. And so Sam then thought, Sam talked to Alex and Sonia. Right. I don't know why Sonia comes along. She's just a handicap. Turn off the light. <laughs> I don't know why Alex and Sam don't do it alone. And really, Alex could have done it all by himself and not gotten caught because he has every reason to be in the factory. Yep. He runs the place. Yep. He could have just said, I came in to check on something. I wanted to see if there was any humans in my machines. They're frank. It's a, it's a, a undercover op. They're yep. waiting. Yep. And they arrest the whole family. No, they don't. They just let them go because now they know that it was Rafe and Helen. So then they go to Rafe and Helen's house. Why? Because that's where they are to get them. I guess. <laughs> Rafe pretends he did all of it. Oh, that's himself. right. He's in the blind. Yeah, they go get Why him. Why don't they take him to the shop, cop shop after the blind? Because they want them both. Okay. And they couldn't just separate and each of them arrest one of them separately. Rafe <laughs> cops to the murder and Helen puts her hand on his, on his shoulder and goes, oh, Rafe, don't. 
Like she's ready to let him take it. She is ready to let him take it. Mm-hmm. And she he doesn't know that she's going to bulldoze his wood and put in a safe way. Field way. Field way. And it's not that. It's an entire like subdivision of houses yeah. in the state. Because Albert Wood is the most valuable asset of the company. Yes. But he would never sell that. The jewel in the crown. So he can't know. Yeah. She was going to completely backstab him. Totally. And then go, oh, Rafe, you'll get over it. Because her concern is keeping the relish company going, which is dumb. Because it is an antiquated thing that they're making. It's not going to last. This is another episode where everybody who should have children doesn't have children. Then we get the best scene ever. Yes. They take... Helen and Rafe away and Anselm and Caro get their last scene. <laughs> and it's awesome because they do our job. Yeah. They go, oh, we're going to have to work now, aren't we? <laughs> they do the after the credits <laughs> for us. They say that. And then we see a tree fall in the hide. So we know they've sold, they've sold off Albert Wood and they're going to bulldoze the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. And sad Tom bins the relish. Doesn't, it's not good anymore. They've changed the recipe or something. Yeah. It's and got, there goes the hide. I wonder if they built that hide just to destroy oh, it. Oh, I'm sure they did. It's got Helen's tears in it. Doesn't taste Helen's good anymore. Tears. And a little bit of Dexter's thong. Yes, Dexter's thong. <laughs> so, best corpse of the episode. It's it, He's up there with one of like the 10 best corpses in Midsummer. I yes. Think. You know, him, him and the crop circle guy. And I totally believe that this episode started with, oh, my gosh, what if one somebody went through one of those bottle sterilizers? They'd be so dead. Oh, yeah. So then they built this whole episode but around that. They wouldn't them. stay in there unless they yeah. were already dead. Yeah. So we'd have to kill them yeah. or knock them unconscious or something. The whole thing. Where would that happen? A bottling plant. Who has a bottling plant? A relish company. company. Yeah. They're run by a family. Yeah. Yep. And the whole episode flows from that. Yep. So after the credits, Anselm and Caro are now, they've sold off the factory. They've sold off the woods. They've got their money yep. back to London. Yep. Amelia's probably got enough to live on. Yeah, I would say so. I would say that the factory is sold. So either it's being run without the family for field way. Derek Lockwood's going to go to jail too for trying to scare the old lady. Yeah, they won't Intimidation. press charges. They won't press charges. Do you think Alex, Sam, and Sonia are out of jobs? I do. Well, Sam is already retired. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Fieldway, if they keep the relish factory going, would probably keep on Alex to run it. I would assume so. They tried to cover a crime. They tried to help hide evidence of a crime. Yeah. Do you think they actually knew that Helen and Rafe killed Dexter? Why would you care about the glasses? Because they know who De- Dexter Lockwood is. Yeah. Like, Why else would they have had his They glasses? had to know that shenanigans were going on. Yeah, I suppose. Keith is going to have to get a new job. Yeah. He clearly sucks at his job. Well, Jackie will make sure that it's with somebody who takes care of him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that's sauce for the goose. Ah, you can find Midsummer Maniacs on Twitter, Instagram, and email. We are also... On the Facebook group uh, for Midsummer and Acorn and the subreddit where you've posted so nicely about our relationship. Aww. We love uh, you too. Anywhere else you can find Maniacs. Next episode, episode 43 for us, season eight, episode eight, the last Scott episode, mm-hmm. Midsummer Rhapsody. We did reach out to the actor who plays Scott. To see if he would give us an interview, but he wasn't interested. But he was very nice response. Very nice response. Super nice response. But we tried, guys. Yeah. We really did try. Yeah. We thought, what else could he be doing right now? Well, he mostly does theater. They're closed. Yeah. Maybe he has time for an interview. Maybe he has time for an interview. Apparently not. His name is John Hopkins. Yeah. Which is a big university. Johns name. Hopkins. Yeah. 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 We tried. Yep. Anyhow. Midsummer Rhapsody next week. Yes. Bye, Maniacs. Bye, Maniacs.
my nephew, who's the amateur pro wrestler. Yeah. He works there now. It's the largest uh, weed factory in Canada, I think. Cannabis. Yeah. Growing factory. Yep. They used to they used to have cho- make chocolate there. Now they grow pot. It's munchies in reverse. 